So um, believe it or not, in within the next six hours, um, they're going to be starting the official 100-year celebration for the Seroptimist. They have on the Seroptimist International website, they actually have a countdown clock that's going to show that it's going to start with, like I said, six hours from now. So Seroptimist International uh, consists of um, four different federations. Uh, we're part of the, obviously, the um, Seroptimist International of the Americas, but there also there's a Seroptimist International of Europe. Um, also for Great Britain and Ireland, and then also Southwest Pacific, which would include uh, Australia. Um, the exciting news is starting just last month in July, um, they began to initiate a new federation in Africa. So they are reaching out to people to begin starting that there as well. Um, so right now, um, as of what I found on the website, just to be really honest here, um, <laughs> so there's seven, <laughs> So worldwide, there's 72,000 clubs that have, we have members that are in 121 countries um, at the local and national uh, level. And all, with, all our, with all of our clubs, the um, emphasis is on educating, empowering, and enabling um, and giving opportunities for women and girls. So um, we do encourage men to join. Men of, um, in the Guam Club have actually held the leadership position of being president. Um, but our focus is always about what's best for women and empowering women in that way. So um, the vision for the organization the, in the international sense is um, to have women and girls achieve their individual and collective potential, realizing their aspirations and having an equal voice in creating strong, peaceful communities worldwide. Um, so Seroptimus, um, we're dedicated to transforming lives and the status of women and girls through education, empowerment, and enabling again. Uh, so again, we want to, we have the advancement of women, our, our principal goals, um, high ethical um, standards, human rights for all, equality, development, and peace, and, um, and you know, the goodwill for all kinds of things across the world. Um, so the founding of the very first um, Swapimist organization, our club was in Oakland, California in 1921. So that, like, again, I mentioned that we're going to be starting our 100-year celebration. Um, the SI International, um, they sought to bring about changes that they saw. What was happening then in that, um, the San Francisco, um, Oakland Bay Area was, at that time, women were not allowed to join um, any of the philanthropic um, organizations. They were all male-dominated, male-oriented. And um, as women will often do, we'll decide that we'll just make our own club and do our own thing. And so that's what we've done over the years, over the last century. Um, so again, uh, we want women to um, be able to have the education, the confidence, and the skills to advocate for themselves and where they're not there yet. Um, the mission of our organization is to help them achieve that, okay? So again, um, the first club was in 1921 in um, Oakland. Um, they found out at the same time, uh, almost exactly the same time, there was a similar organization that was being developed in Great Britain um, with the emphasis on taking um, young orphaned girls and giving them a safe place to, um, to be raised. The two organizations were not aware of each other. It wasn't until 1928 that they started to meld them, okay? So again, um, it's always been women advocating to protect children and educate women, okay? So, um, so that's the, the broad, broad strokes historically and um, across the international spectrum. So the Seroptimist International of the Americas, which is our um, primary organization, um, there's 1,300 clubs um, in 21 counties and territories. Um, right now. So that's just within North America and that. Um, so we've reached out and under our um, arm and as part of our um, area code, our area is um, our most recent um, chartered club, which is in Palau. And so they were chartered two years ago. And uh, Marilyn will speak more to that, how we were able to help them. Um, our club here on island start, was started in 2014, I believe. Pam will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and it was um, 
Guam had so many members that they've actually broken into two clubs. They have SI um, uh, Marianas and they also have SI Guam. Uh, so they um, advocated, uh, they approached people here on island, women on island uh, that were already in somewhat leadership roles uh, to see if they were interested in doing it. So Bank of Guam has been our primary funder and giving money for some of um, the chartering of our club here as well as some of the primary, um, the charter members, uh, several of them were affiliated with the Bank of Guam. So that's a connection and they continue to um, really support us in that way, okay? So again, um, global, so we're a global volunteer organization that provides uh, resources and opportunities for women and girls to reach their full potential, okay? So what we're when we're talking about, um, you know, our four core values or whatever, you know, how all the clubs, we all, everybody loves those values and then it's sometimes hard to explain what they really mean. So for us, it's uh, gender equality, which is fairly self-explanatory, but again, to not, um, to have women in positions where they're not being discriminated because of, of their female gender. Um, empowerment, which I'll talk about more later. Um, education, and again, I'll uh, go into that in more depth in a minute, and diversity and fellowship. So despite the fact that uh, two of our three faces up here are um, women of uh, pale complexion, um, actually the majority of our club is not. <laughs> it just happens to be, the, I guess we were the ones that were available and willing today to do it. So um, I've been told by people that I respect on island that we have some, somewhat the reputation of, oh, it's just a club for white women. And it's like, no, it's not. It's for any woman that wants to help make a difference in a, another woman or a girl's life, okay? So again, um, when we're talking about um, a woman being empowered, we want her to be um, economically empowered um, because a lot of times that, um, if you're not economically empowered, then the control that you have over your life and within your life is going to be diminished. At any time you're dependent financially on others, it's going to be, um, you're going to be vulnerable. Okay. So again, um, I, everybody has a different life, but we want to give people, uh, women and girls, the power that they have to be able to make that an achievable goal for themselves. Okay. Uh, we want, um, we need, want women and girls to have a voice in um, their, like I said, financial decisions that shape their lives and the lives of their families. Um, they have a personal sense of autonomy, um, self-confidence. Again, if you have, if you're able to have sufficient education to be able to do the job that you want to do, hopefully enjoy doing, bring money into your family, obviously you're going to have more self-confidence, more self-esteem. And once you're established in those areas, then you can raise your voice to speak out for others that are still on that path towards getting there. And that's exactly who and what all of the women in our club are. They're, they're really nice ladies. It's fun to spend time with them, I think. Okay, <laughs> so again, uh, so the, the reason that we're emphasizing um, with the Live Your Dream Award, which Marilyn will be talking about, um, it's a cash award that allows a woman to stay in school. And the reason that, our, again, our emphasis is on education is because um, studies have shown, um, what I'm quoting here um, is from population, uh, the reference bureau, but women, um, when women learn, families live healthier, right? So women, if a, if a woman has, um, educate, has been educated, then she can share with her family better nutrition. Um, when girls go to school, they are more likely to get paying jobs and their financial contributions to their family and their nations increase. Uh, when girls have educated moms, they are more likely to be enrolled in school and to reach higher levels of education. And when girls are educated, their countries are more likely to have greater economic growth. So again, it's women that um, are pivotal in these things. So it, again, like decades and decades worth of studies have have proven all those things to be true. Um, one of the things that we're looking at with um, our international organization is they, um, since 1928, I believe was the first time that they appeared at the United Nations. So we've always been intertwined with them, um, recognized by UNICEF and all of those as um, good, or, you know, an organization. So right now, our um, the international president has a list of agendas and such, and then we're trying to tie in with that. Uh, the 
previous years, um, the previous decades, it's been, um, again, uh, women, uh, trafficking and that kind of thing. Um, now, uh, the emphasis is shifting slightly um, towards clean water. Uh, again, uh, there's speculation that in the coming decades or centuries that uh, there's more likely to be wars fought over access to clean, uh, safe water than oil. So, the, you know, driven in the past, we've had conflicts driven by oil, and now we're going to be more towards that. So the sustainable development goals um, that were set by the United Nations um, for the sustainable development for the last 17, so they have 17 goals and 169 targets. And the Seroptimist um, directly support um, five of those goals and 12 of the targets. So those are to end poverty in all forms everywhere. Ambitious, but you know we can make progress on that. Um, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote uh, lifelong learning opportunities for all. Uh, reduce inequality within and among countries. Uh, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Also to promote uh, sustained, inclusive, and uh, sustainable economic growth and productive employment and decent work for all. And again, we you know can see what's happening on the island that you know if you don't have access to education, if you don't have um, that, it you know can put you on the wrong path. So you know the more support that we can give anybody that's trying to achieve their education goals, that's important. And when I'm talking education, I'm not talking just, you know, getting your high school diploma or going straight into the college pathway, because there's many people that that's not the way their brain works. That's not what they choose to do with their life. So um, the Live Your Dream Award that Marilyn will be speaking to also um, can be awarded to trades. Um, it's not, they have a separate uh, group of awards that will go to women that are uh, uh, trying to achieve master's degree and, um, and also doctorates. So that's, uh, we're, not, we're not quite at that level. So um, again, um, some of the statistics that I was, um, came across as I was looking at things, um, researching this so I wouldn't sit here blabbering too much. Um, there's quite a few alarming things that are happening um, internationally. Right now, with um, because of the COVID, um, they were saying that in um, a fair number of countries where uh, female attendance at school is already um, something that's problematic, that they're anticipating that more than 60% of the females that have had to lose school time now um, during this pandemic will not return to school. Uh, the other concerns are, and Pam will address this more, is that by not having uh, children um, going to school, that they're not having um, extra adult eyes on them. So there's gonna be a lot of um, more abuse that may be happening and isn't reported. Even if the reports are, are elevated, there's still more going on that we're not aware of. So again, we're just, um, our whole mission is to em empower women, bring out the best in women and girls and encourage them. And uh, at one point, um, I know that we were going into the high schools and speaking to um, like the juniors and seniors, uh, maybe like there were like six or seven of us up on the stage and we all had different stories. But the essential message that we want to get through is the person that you see sitting in front of you right now that have, you know, has a house, has a, a car, has a family, it wasn't a straight path. We all, we all zigzagged. You know, I shared um, with the group, the group um, and the students that we were talking to that I was um, pre a pre-med student and I went into one of my, um, you know, my upper division uh, classes one day and said, I don't want to hang around with this, see these people for the next eight years. And I dropped out of college and I worked as, as basically a nanny for a year and a half before I went to respiratory therapy school. And it was one of those things where you know, nobody, you don't know when you look at somebody, the road that they've traveled to achieve the success that they had. And because I had strong women throughout my life encouraging me, then I was able to achieve what I have. So again, paying it forward and helping out others. That's pretty much all I have to say. <laughs> Marilyn, to you. Good afternoon. Um, so I will be talking I, about
but um, the Live Your Dream. Um, it's the signature um, event for Soroptimist International uh, worldwide and also here in Saipan. So um, our Live Your Dream Awards has helped thousands of women and, fa and their families to reclaim their dreams and improve their standard of living. The Live Your Dream Award funds women's effort to increase their education or improve their skills. As Maureen was saying, it's not all about going back, you know, going to college. It's also going to trade school and just improving your uh, skills um, at the same time as your education. So I'm just going to uh, share some of the, um, the award levels and the um, elig eligibility requirements for Live Your Dream. At the award levels, um, there's um, three sets of award levels. So the first one is, of course, our Leave Your Dream um, Gala, which is on October 10th at Fiesta Resort. And that's usually about a $1,000 uh, rewards. Although we have uh, in the past have uh, been able to provide more than $1,000 uh, in awards. And then once a, a candidate um, receive that award, they go to the next level, which we call regional level. And um, the, that um, recipient will then compete with the, um, the other awardees from the different clubs that we're in, which is um, we, um, Guam, Hawaii, and California's. Um, and then, um, if the recipient wins that, they go to the next level, which is the international finalist. And that uh, award is up to $10,000 in awards. So there's, um, so a person can pretty much has a potential to receive between $1,000 all the way up to $16,000 um, to further their education or um, other trainings and, um, that they want to pursue. Um, the other um, thing that I would like to share is about the eligibility. So I will just go ahead and read down the eligibility requirements um, for a woman if she wants to apply for a Leave Your Dream um, Award. So the eligibility requirements is provides the primary financial support for a woman and her dependents, include her children, spouse, partners, siblings, and or parents, has a financial need, is enrolled or has been accepted to vocational and an undergraduate program, um, is motivated to achieve her education or career goals, reside in one of the Soroptimist International American member countries, which include, um, for us, I'll just say, you know, Saipan, Guam, Palau, Hawaii, or California, and has not previously been recipient of the Soroptimist Women's Opportunity or Live Your Dream Award, and does not have a graduate degree. So it's pretty much for an undergrad or somebody that wants to go to a, um, a technical school. So um, some of the things that we know um, and we have um, come across since we've um, started our club here in Saipan in the last seven years um, is I know that we have um, awarded, even though it's been six years or seven years? Six years. I know in one year we did uh, award two. So um, in that six years time, we've awarded eight recipients or on, October 10th, that makes it an, uh, will award number eight, an eight recipient, or it could be more depending on the applications that comes in. Uh, and I would just want to let everybody know that they still have until tonight to turn in their applications. Um, and one of the, um, what I want to share too is the impact of the Live Your Dream um, for physical year um, 2018 and 2019. In 2018-2019, um, Soroptimist International awarded $2.6 million to 1,655 motivated women did receive this award. 
and 918 of those women received additional supports beyond the award. And that's one of the things that we like to share is we just don't award a person and then says, okay, goodbye. We are always there to continue to, um, to support either um, needs, uh, not always financially, but also as a um, somebody like a mentor that we would like to continue doing. And those awards was across 21 countries. Um, just some statistics as well. From 19, since 1972, uh, we have um, awarded more than $30 million to over tens of thousands of women across the globe. And when I think of that from this small little island in the middle of the Pacific, you're like, wow, you know, you do, even though we might just impact one or two person here, but it's one or two women that's going to move forward, have a secure um, family, um, and you'll be able to complete, complete their education, improve their um, standard of living, um, increase their self-esteem. Um, as Maureen was saying, um, two years ago when I joined the club, uh, I was already a club member for about two years. Um, and Palau was just open, as you know, I am Palauan by uh, nature. So I was going down there for, um, for work, actually. And um, they just opened, so they were very hesitant about um, holding a leave your dream. So I went down, I met with the club president, the officers, a couple of the members, and I said, you know, it's, it's very simple. It's not as complicated as what people think. You know, you look at, when you go into the application form, you're like, oh my goodness, this is a lot, but it is very simple. It's, you apply for it, you put your name, it's more about it is if you have the need. And the need is, you know, do you wanna, um, complete that education and you are the head of your household or the main um, financial support of your, of your household. So um, while I was there, I was do it, working during the first half, six hours a day. And then what we did is we went to the high schools, a couple of Pala high school, and we talked to teachers, we talked to students. And because a lot of them didn't know how to apply for this. Well, I left Palau, two weeks later, they, uh, I got a message from the president of the Soroptimist in Palau and said, you know, we have people that are going in and applying. We have a lot of applicants. We have more than 25 applicants in there now. So they did hold it and they did award somebody. Um, it was a, a mother who was a uh, student at this, you know, she was a, a mom who was also a like a, um, a school a substitute teacher who wanted to finish and had uh, just two more semesters. And that lady today, when I go down to Palau, I, I get to meet her and, and share time with her because she's like, I never knew. And, and now she is also a member of the club and has been really helpful about um, getting people to know more about Soroptimist and about Live Your Dream and how it impacted her life. Um, and I guess, so that's what so, um, Leave Your Dream is all about. It's pretty much, it's, it's about awarding somebody or about applying to finalize your higher education so you can have a better standard of living, increasing your self-esteem. And I just wanna share some um, last, um, um, numbers with you because this is from um, a recipient from three years ago reports and it says 87% of women who goes out and have um, accepted the Live Your Dream Award has completed their education, they have improved their standard of living, they have increased 93% uh, uh, self-esteem and 97% of them are now living in a safe environment and out of these 97% of these women, 53% of them who were survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, trafficking, and prostit uh, prostitution. 
And this is one of the things that has made me really want to um, go out and talk about this is because out here in the islands, it's one of those hush hush we don't talk about. But I think as more women become more educated about just not going to school, it's just being being more educated and being have that confident. More more, more women will not be. Um, oh, what's the word I'm trying to get? Um, more prone to get um, to fall into this type of um, problems here in the islands. So, um, and with that, I would like to turn it on to Pam to talk more about this last part of the, what So Optimist is all about. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I'm a charter member, which means I was, I've been here since we started and it was 2013 and we've had seven years of awards so we had this will be our ninth award because we had the two that one year but other than that <laughs> each year um Sraptismus international um the president or sia the president sets a goal and like maureen touched on um those goals of the past have been um anti-human trafficking um domestic violence stopping domestic violence and then the, the most recent one is uh, clear water, clean water. And if you think about it, these, all of those international projects go on top of each other. Um, without empowering women and having clubs like um, SINMI, there wouldn't be as much focus on what happens in the household. And by empowering the women to get out of that situation, we are able to elevate them to a place where then they can elevate their children to, the pl to a place as well as their community. That community has to be sustainable. Hence, we need to have the um, clean water. And the human trafficking element, which we have all know exists everywhere in the world, no community has any um, uh, natural immunity to it. There is no place that we don't have human trafficking, no matter how much people want to think it's not in their community. Um, and so one of the things we've made a special ongoing project is our club support of uh, Goomer Esperanza and Caradoc. We spend a lot of time going up and sharing our bounty with the, with the women and the children that may be at the women's shelter or in transitional housing. Some of those projects include uh, the return to uh, school, the school supplies project. We, we provide gift certificates to a family and however many kids they have, that's how many gift certificates they get. Um, we also make sure that the uh, shelter has Christmas, and Thanksgiving and Mother's Day and Easter. We try to just share some of our um, goodwill and what and pay it forward, as Maureen said. You know, everyone that helped us achieve our goals, we are trying to do that with the uh, women that and children that are in the uh, Guma Esperanza programs. So, which brings me to the fact that we know on this island that there is a lot of domestic violence and we know that certain events trigger even more um a rise in that in that number of violent of that level of violence covid the typhoons the reporting may not be as um, commiserate with the level of the abuse that's taking place in the household and we know that because as soon as, the, as soon as the women have a means to escape the village or wherever they are isolated, that's when we get the shelter is full. Um, traditionally, internationally, certain events like the Super Bowl, um, the NBA playoff, the Final Four, big sporting events, um, the FIFA soccer championships in Europe, uh, these kind of events, even the conventions in, in normal years, not in 2020, that 
political conventions, you see an uptick in human trafficking. And so what we have done with SINMI is that we present the, the issue in programs. We have uh, quarterly programs where we bring in nonprofits. And I've spoken there and Laurie Gumero, the executive director of Caridot, just trying to keep the education level, keep the community aware of the fact that we have this happening here. And it happens in many forms. I mean, somebody that has a guy coming in, a family that has uh, some statesider coming to visit and giving them goodies. Um, and next thing you know, the states I would like to take their daughter just to down to have something to eat. And that one thing leads to another and you have a, a, a exploitation of a minor, which is in and of itself a definition of human trafficking. So that kind of awareness building and community outreach is something that's really vital to empowering women so that they can empower their families and care and take care of their families. Education is important. and. As, again, I think it's the focus of all of the clubs in Saipan, or Saipan, Sir Optimist International. But uh, it goes to be to even more than that. Um, the sustainability of the community is, is, and sustainable development of the community is also enhanced when you empower women and educate, educate women. As Maureen said, when you educate a woman, it benefits her family and her community, not just her. And the more you, and as my sisters have said, the more you empower a woman, the more voice she has, and the more willing she is to speak up because she has the confidence because you've given her the education to do it. Um, as RBG, the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would say, uh, until, until women have a seat at every table where decisions are made, we, are, we have not accomplished our goal, and we're a long ways from that. So we have, we have a goal that we can continue to strive to achieve, which means we get to continue to work together and with our community to empower that community and the women in it. Um, some, of the, some of the most important outreaches we did in the beginning, when we first started, we seemed to have a little more energy than at the typhoons and the COVID, but in normal years, we always try to go and speak to the high schools and the junior highs in order to speak to like the freshmen and the sophomores, boys and girls, young men and young women, both in a joint setting. Maureen and I did it several times and it was very rewarding because we would just discuss what is success? What does success look like? And as Maureen said, nobody sitting up here probably started out thinking they would be what they're going to be. I was going to be president, so I obviously fell short of that goal. Um, but be that as it may, the most rewarding part of our uh, club and its mission is the fact that we get to see results. And we see the results in our community all the time. We have former um, Live Your Dream winners who were actually now part of our, of our club and we get to watch them blossom and grow. And, and it's really rewarding. It's like having a your own kids all over again. <laughs> Only you don't have to, you don't have to wash your clothes. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I just can't tell you how rewarding it is. And the fact that we have tried to bring our, our mission to things even as important as the Chamber of Commerce and Rotary and discuss these kinds of things with them and including red flags for trafficking, red flags for sexual and domestic violence. Um, we work very, we have a seat at the table with uh, Macy's Coalition, with the name that's way too big to say, um, Northern Marianas Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. I did it! <laughs> anyway, so we, like with, as with our international group, we don't work by ourselves. We team up to work together and make sure that we have more bang for our buck in, in, a, in a very crass way of saying it. Um, Disruptive Business International works with the UN Sustainable Development and the two have always uh, worked together and in, in concert, if you will, to make sure that the development 
agendas and goals that are set by the UN, we can pick and choose which ones we want. Maureen stated the five goals that we choose, we've chosen to focus on. Um, again, ending poverty in all forms everywhere, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education, and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all, reduce inequality within and among countries, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, and promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and de decent work for all. And when, when we benefit our, our women and our girls, they, they benefit the community, and the men get to be benefited as well because we have another perspective and another voice. Um, so with that, I think we're about to the time when we can turn it over to questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pam. That was, that was great. Uh, Maureen, Marilyn, thank you so much. I think, yeah, this is a good time to pause and see if we have any reaction, comments or questions from the audience. Uh, I'll remind the audience that uh, you're welcome to post something on our chat and I will read it out in the order I receive it. Or if you'd like to speak directly to the panelists uh, and for everyone to hear your voice, feel free to raise your hand in the chat and I can get to you that way as well. Um, so th we do have someone here. We do have a, a comment question in the chat. I'll go ahead and read it out. And uh, either of you on the panel can decide how to take that. Um, so it goes, the humanities is about the human experience. And the work by the Seroptimist creates the dynamic of the interaction between the organization and the women slash children. Would the organization be able to raise awareness by sharing the stories of our women, of survival, of recovery, and of hope? What can we do to humanize our sisters, mothers, and friends through stories, documentaries, exhibits from the Seroptimist International NMI to empower our community to see something, say something, and do something? I'll start. Um, every year when we have our award ceremony, they, we get to share the story of the award winner. But that's something that has to be done only with permission of the, the awardee, the recipient. Um, so as, as much as she's willing to let her story be told, we try to share that story through our, the night of the event, the award ceremony, but also by posting that or letting that out in a press release. Um, some recipients have been very willing, others not so much. Um, but again, it's, I agree with um, the question. Uh, Seroptimus needs to be more of a presence um, in types of panels, like with the Humanities Council, like this. And um, I don't know how document exhibits we could certainly start something like that as a project. Weigh in, <laughs> any of you ladies. I think, I think it's something that we can bring to, um, we're having um, a general meeting on Thursday before our big event, the gala on Saturday night. So I do think it's something that we can bring up. I think sometimes we get, um, I speak for myself, um, even though it looks like I'm comfortable speaking in public, <laughs> I've been having anxiety all day. My family's laughing at me. It's like, why is this such a big deal? And I'm like, <laughs> so I think part of it is just um, putting ourselves forward. And I think it's maybe for me, it's a good reminder that is as difficult as it is for me, it's easier for me than it is for a lot of women that are living in the villages that are in these situations. And the more that we're out there and the more they see our smiling face, then the more likely they are to share their stories with us and then we can share them with the community at large because I do think it's really very important. Um, one of um, the pleasures that I've had over the last couple of years is with my involvement with NMTI is seeing these um, young girls maybe from other islands that are coming here li that literally the first day I had them in class they had the hoodie halfway over their face and they sat in the corner and didn't make eye contact. And a year later, they're talking back to somebody else. 
and kind of getting sassy and they found their voice and they're like, Maureen, what did you do? She used to be so quiet. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Girls aren't supposed to be quiet. They're supposed to use their voice to let the world know how they feel. So that's what I would share. (laughs) The other thing too, I mean, the focus of the question seems to be more about humanizing um, our sisters and mothers and daughters. so that they won't become victims of abuse. When I see see something, say something, and do something, that's that's a that's a uh, motto or not a motto. It's a um, it's a phrase that is used in "Look Beneath the Surface," which is look if if you look beneath the surface, you may find a trafficking victim, and those kinds of um, those kinds of public outreach is something we need to do more of, even if. Even with the the, the Gumar Esperanza um, residents and children, you know, maybe we could start something like an art exhibit competition with them. Oh, that's cool. Marilyn. That's a that's a very good idea. I think that's, <laughs> that's something we can start really doing. And um, you know, with uh, this pandemic and not being able to um, do a lot of stuff, uh, but there are those little things that we can probably start doing. Um, due to uh, this social distancing and stuff like that, which I, I'll look more into it maybe, um, and then we can, I can have something to share this coming up Thursday. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. All right, so we have uh, another comment on the chat that I'd like to share with you guys. Um, this person says, you hosted slash honored women candidates for this upcoming election. Please elaborate on how optimistic you are about women in the CNMI beginning to rise to top level offices in both public and private sectors. We've come a long way in promoting women leaders in our islands and it makes us as a people really proud of, the, of this rise. Yeah, that um, we had a, we do a forum. Uh, this was our second, we started it in 2018. And the 2018 uh, forum was such a success. It was, uh, we just had to do it this year. And luckily, even with the COVID, we were able to gather the, uh, the candidates. There's 10 female candidates um, all together. And- oh, oh yeah, 10 showed up, yes, sorry. Yeah, well, yeah, there's 11 if you, because yeah, one didn't show up. Um, but anyway, it would, what struck me is we were able to gather, which you need, it needs to be an in-person thing. I mean, I love Zoom, but again, like you said, Leo, sometimes you just need to have that person-to-person um, interaction. And so what struck all of us, I think, we were so excited and, and happy that we, we just don't have women running. We have really intelligent, professional, um, diverse women running. You know, they came from all different, you know, I, island groupings, you know, we had very different people in different walks of life, but they all got to get got along and they all were complimentary to each other and they were just amazingly fun to listen to, share their plans. We kind of like to half apologize because of the, the COVID and the social distancing. Uh, we weren't really, because I've had people scold me for not inviting them or letting them know. I didn't even know about it. And what it was was because we had, there were so many candidates and each was allowed to bring two guests that if, if all of the club members had shown up, we were maxed out in our 50 capacity. So that was the, the reason that it wasn't in. So going forward, future years, we'll have it open to a larger public. Because we're a nonprofit, we're not allowed to endorse a candidate. So therefore it was just letting them get up and, and get to know us. Because uh, one thing that strikes, that struck me and still does sometimes here is um, you often don't hear from the politician, like, why, why are you running, rather than just the smiling face in your family's names. And yeah. so one of the things that I, that everybody was remarking on was, I mean, some of these women have, you know, degrees in finance, they have degrees in public management, they have worked for and retired, they've been a, you know, school teacher, you can control a classroom, you can control a community. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think for all of us, I was, I was just really, these, some of these women I knew casually, and I had no idea the degrees that they held and the experience that they hold. So I think it's really encouraging that 
if they, the majority of them get into office, that they will be able to, you know, steer our ship in another direction. <laughs> It was fun also because many of the women brought their brought either interns from their offices or their children. Um, and so they got to watch their, you know, their role model up there sharing their expertise. And it was, yeah, it was a delightful evening. I'm very optimistic about the future of women as leaders. Yes. Um, one of the things that I think we really missed is we we didn't um, do any um, live streaming. I wish we could have because um, it was really a great night and we really got to know these women and we hope, we really wish that more people have got to hear their stories. Um, one of the things that we kind of also talked about during the night was um, this is the 100 years of the women's right to vote, right? The 19th Amendment. And that was one of the things that we talked about during the night was what made you wanted to run as a woman, um, especially being an island girl who we kind of always be in the, the strength in the back, pushing the men forward. Um, so um, I think um, it's, it, the, it's slowly the changes is coming because some of these women came with their spouses who were in the back pushing their women forward. And that was uh, one of the things that I really wish we could have um, showed it more to more people than just that little group we had that night. And I think like Pam said and Maureen said uh, that going forward, we will really want to um, have that explode a lot more and uh, maybe do something different next time to try and get it more out there. And not to sound too uh, chauvinistic, but if you want something <laughs> done, you have to have a woman involved. <laughs> All right, so we have a, a couple of commendations uh, coming through in the chat, uh, but no questions at this point. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to ask a question. I'm glad you guys brought up, uh, you know, the 100th anniversary of the suffrage movement, uh, the women's rights to vote. And in the context of the earlier question about seeing more women uh, rise up into elected offices and other leadership positions, um, you know, what's on my mind is, uh, is there any uh, impact locally on this history of, uh, of the women's right to mo vote? Um, and, you know, what is your sense, perhaps talking to other women about this election as you say, having very intelligent women running for office, what sort of the, what is the feeling in, in the women, in the community among women uh, about this election, their participation level? Uh, yeah, all of that. Do you have a sort of response to that? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think participation is, is higher than I've seen it in years. I mean, just the revitalization of the Democratic Party. You have to have, a, if you have a two party system, you have to have two parties. And uh, one of the nice things is to see the Democratic Party reorganize um, in order to um, give an option in the election. And the fact that they went out and recruited nine, nine or, yeah, nine. Um, very intelligent, well-spoken, educated women. Um, it just speaks volumes to how we're seeing the 100th year anniversary. Not only that, but when in 2016, when there was the march um, in Washington, the Women's March in Washington, we had one here. Then there was a, uh, the anniversary of that march. We had a march of women here. I mean, women have become very active in the last four years here in the island and also, you know, in the, uh, in the United States or the mainland. Um, but I think that I was always in awe of women in the CNMI and how powerful they were in my mind, even if they weren't in elected offices. They seemed to always occupy offices where they had power, you know, head of a bank, head of the... Uh, school board, you know, something. They were always head of DFS. You know, there were just always powerful women in the CNMI that uh, 
I had noticed when I first came here in 1989. But I think it has increased. Yeah, and specifically, you know, one of the people that's running gave up a position that was paying $80,000 a year. So she knows that if she doesn't win, or if she even if she does win, that she's going to be bringing home to her family less than half the salary. But the passion is there. I think that that's what really struck me is that is just perhaps the, the women are feeling so strong about it because they realize that unless they stand up and literally are willing to be counted, that it's nothing's going to change. That if we just talk amongst ourselves, nothing's going to change. But the more public we make it, and again, reinforcing people have to be involved. You know, my son is 23, and you know he's talking about um, the state of the world and the state on island. It's like tell your friends to vote, use your voice. You don't get, you don't get to complain about the results if you didn't cast a ballot. <laughs> Marilyn, do you have anything to add to that? Um, you know, as uh, somebody who lived here most of my life and being an island girl, I, I am so proud to see that there are more women ever uh, running in the office than in the last 40 years. Um, I know there's been a lot of women, a very strong um, women, very influential women in the island, but um, the having 11 or 10 women running for office this year, um, that has, you know, compared to the uh, two years ago, uh, it's, it's amazing. I'm, I, I'm just makes me proud to be an island woman who's in, in this time being here to see that. And I hope that it continues. Right. Well, we're coming close to the end of the hour and we have a question, another question in our chat that I'd like to uh, put out there for you guys. Uh, it reads the essence of diversity equity and inclusion seem to be more revealed these days. How does your organization handle the contemporary issues within this context? I think I'm puzzled. <laughs> well, I, again, like I said, I think we already have a lot of diversity. We have, like I said, we have women in our organization that were you know, born in, born in the United States, but have, have made the island our home. We have women that um, are islanders that have gone to the States and received their education and decided to come back. So I think we actually, like I said, um, the, the photos that you're seeing in front of you right now don't reveal the diversity of our club. You should have gotten a picture so people could see that we really are all different, um, you know, ages, tones. We have, you know, women that have just given birth all the way to you know women that are have you know have multiple grandchildren so you know even the from when i first joined the club the diversity in ages is, has changed a lot and i think we've gotten more um participation from the local women as well yeah a lot younger generation of women also yeah yeah right and one of the things that i think i see is, um there's somebody who's who grew up here during the trustory time until today, um, went to the States and came back. Um, I think we've always been, Saipan has always been a, a very diversified island. Uh, we started off with the trust territory with all the Pacific Islanders uh, throughout Micronesia that used to live here. So um, growing up with that, I am so happy to see that there's more and um, the diversity of equity is, is, is more open now. I think uh, as more women run for office, more women are in, um, uh, being role models, being in the different um, position um, that makes affects other women, I think uh, has really made uh, to me as it showed me that the next generations coming will be more stronger than ever um, because of that, as they see it today. All right. Well, um, Pam, Maureen, Marilyn, thank you so much for being on our panel. Uh, we are going to have to close this at this time. I, I do want to thank the audience as well for being with us. Um, this, again, we'll, we will, this was recorded and it will be uploaded at some point this month on our YouTube channel. So look for that. Um, I do also want to encourage everyone who's participated as an audience member 
uh, to just quickly help us by filling out a survey that's going to pop up on your screen as soon as we end this webinar. Um, if you're not able to get it at the moment, uh, you should see a follow-up email from us in a day or two. Please uh, open that up and fill out the survey. It shouldn't take more than a minute. Uh, it would really help us in terms of our programming here. Um, I also want to put in a plug and also remind everyone it's CNMI Humanities Month. Uh, we have a, a full calendar of activities, uh, webinars, and, and other things happening on Tinian and Rhoda that we'd like everyone to participate in. Uh, you can find more details on our website at www.nmhcouncil.org. Um, but just with what's immediately coming up next week, we have two, two webinars again on Friday um, mm. for Humanities Fridays. And, and the 10 o'clock, um, the 10 a.m. webinar next Friday is Adaptive Strategies to Food Insecurity Within the Chukis Community of Guam. So we have a newly minted University of Guam graduate who will come on to talk about um, you know, what the Chukis community does in periods where there's uh, food scarcity uh, you know, and, and what do they do traditionally and, and how do they pull together as a community uh, of, around food security. And then at 5 p.m. that same day, uh, we have a webinar entitled Itine Laika Numero Gi Finutsamoru, Changes in Chamorro Plurality. And if you're wondering what plurality is, it has to do with uh, written statements, how I think uh, this is another newly minted graduate from University of Guam who has done a study as part of her master's thesis to look at the differences between elders and the youth and, and, and the movement uh, between uh, making statements uh, that describe humans or animals in the singular sense versus the plural sense. So something around that. Um, so yeah, tune in, tune in for that. Uh, to register, go to, go to our website to find the registration link uh, or reach out to us. I'll send that to you directly. Um, I do have to say that this project was made possible by support from the, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you next Friday. Thank you. Thank you.